Welcome to Between Two Pastries, a not-so-typical nutrition podcast. Nicole and Annie are licensed and registered dietitians. Join them as they discuss hot nutrition topics, challenge popular beliefs, and have a blast doing it. Here are your hosts, Nicole and Annie. Welcome to Between Two Pastries, everybody. This is Nicole. Hey, everyone. It's Annie. We are excited today to have round two of our Sports RD panel. Uh, We had some awesome conversation uh, last time, which I was actually just reviewing a little bit before we even got on um, today, too. And it's just good stuff, ladies. So we thought, Lynn, let's come back together again and um, get a little like get a little personal this time. We're going to get a little personal. So um, let's reintroduce everybody. Whoever wants to go first. Sarah. Yeah, I'll go first. Thanks for the shout out. I love it. Um, Hey, everyone. I'm Sarah Hilvering, back for round two. Excited to be here. Um, I'm a sports dietitian located in Wisconsin in the Milwaukee area. Um, I primarily work with endurance athletes. I also work with team sports as well, too, primarily soccer. And really glad to be back with this group of ladies. So thanks for having me. Heidi Strickler, uh, also a registered sports dietitian. Uh, based in Seattle, but my practice is virtual. So ultimately I like work with people all over the place. And my primary focus is endurance athletes, uh, plant-based athletes, kind of female bodied athletes and female physiology as it pertains to menstrual cycle stuff. And then young athletes with eating disorders and disordered eating, amenorrhea, reds. Uh, yeah. And stoked to be back for round two as well. So I was thinking about like starting it off today and I, I, I was like, in my mind, I started it off in my mind, like I would a consult. So, <laughs> but there so tell me about a time. Thoughts? Yeah. <laughs> afterthoughts from our last session together, like anything that came up for you. <laughs> so... <laughs> nope. Not going to go there. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> not good. I mean, we can go there. I mean, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. no, but honestly, l- I guess, yeah, let's just talk about that. You know, after our conversation, was there something that we didn't talk about that you guys were like, you know what, this is also a really important p- piece. Or did we talk about everything that was important? I don't remember. <laughs> I don't even remember. All of the important topics in an hour. I love it. You know? Yeah. I don't even think that, Brief is that possible? If- no, it's not possible. No, definitely not possible. <laughs> like... The icing, like the tip of the iceberg. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah. It's well, let's just let's remind people, which I assume we talked about. Mm -hmm. You need to eat. Yes, carbs are good. Yes, and fueling during exercise is like the most important thing for every athlete. Absolutely, (laughs) I feel like those are the three. Like, if you can do those things, we're good. You've got it. Yeah, (laughs) like if I can just get people to eat and eat enough. I know. Awesome. I know. Well, well, if that was super easy, then none of us would have jobs. So yeah, yeah no, that's that very is actually true. very Isn't true. Isn't that true? Just so true. <laughs> so I had sent out some questions to everybody prior to our time today because when we talk about some of the things that really drew us into the industry, I think that it 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 helps it helps even our listeners and all of our clients even connect to the real, you know, the real stuff behind, you know why we do what we do. And it's not even just that we believe in, I mean, what we talk about is, is factual. It's just that we also like being a product of, <laughs> of the facts, you know, of like what, you know, what, what feels good and and what we know for sure. So um, one of the first questions that I wanted to kind of pose to everybody is uh, what was your inspiration to even want to become an RD and even just focusing on sports? Like if, did you have like a person in your life? Did you see something? Did you have a, you know, like a, a, this is why kind of an experience where you just have the experience and you're like, oh gosh, this is why I really want to do this field, you know? So anybody have a story like that? Um, so I grew up, like being an athlete uh I soccer was my primary sport so I kind of played that through college um but I was yeah just like a very very active kid very avid athlete and just was fascinated with like the human body and sport and kind of knew from a young age that I wanted to like in some capacity work with athletes and or the human body sports things like that and for a while I thought I wanted to do physical therapy Mm. I was mm-hmm. very 
own as a kiddo and spent many, 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 many days in the physical therapy clinic. Um, and so kind of thought I wanted to go that route, but the university I went to for soccer didn't have a direct like PT program. And I, that was the first year that PT was a required PhD. And so I would be graduating with just like a general bio degree. I was like, I, well, I don't know if I can, you know, if I want to do PT and if I don't, then I'm just going to have a bio degree and what can I do with that, et cetera, et cetera. So I just talked to my advisor and I was like, you know, like what else, what are other options? Mm-hmm. He encouraged me to explore nutrition. And like growing up as a kid, like I didn't think about food ever. Like mm-hmm. I had a diet, but like yeah. I didn't in food or nutrition um and but I remember took I took my first nutrition class was food science and I was sold oh like, cool I, I'm a science nerd yeah food science is awesome it is like, though the chemistry oh, yeah I love it. I and it was love it's it. fun yeah mm-hmm. like the first time I had really ever cooked outside of like toaster waffles and yeah peanut butter sandwiches and <laughs> uh, we've all been there too <laughs> yeah and so I think that definitely like just felt really good and then as a collegiate athlete you know yeah. did have nutrition I mean we had a personal tra- or one of the athletic trainers talked to us about nutrition which it is what it is um but I definitely kind of started to be more aware of like the impact of nutrition on athletic performance with like my teammates and I at the collegiate level <laughs> so yeah I think that was it was kind of this combination of that exposure and like marriage of nutrition and sports at the collegiate level and then cool. just being fascinated with yeah. food science and love it so yeah it was kind of that and back then there was no real like sports nutrition wasn't very big yeah mm-hmm. oh it, at all yeah mm-hmm. it was like weight loss focused clinical focused oh yeah was, was focused mm-hmm. on. um and like sports dietitians were you know a few d1 universities a few pro mm-hmm. teams very few jobs and so luckily my university had a sports nutrition degree so I like double majored in dietetics and nice in, in sports and exercise perfect um so yeah that was kind of my background and yeah and then um was sold um I yeah. love it so so cool Sarah awesome that's awesome Heidi um kind of similar to your story as well too um so definitely some overlaps for sure Um, For me, I always knew I wanted to be in healthcare as well and work with athletes. Very similarly, grew up playing sports, super active. Um, My parents let me explore everything. (laughs) Um, Probably too many activities. (laughs) A lot. Um, A lot growing up. So a lot of time spent in like training sessions, PT as well too. Um, Definitely a route I considered for a little bit. But I loved the way that sport shaped my life, enriched my life. It still does because I still do it. And so when I entered college, I thought, okay, being a sports medicine physician, that's it. Like that's the route I'm going to go down. That just makes a lot of sense. Um, So I hopped on that pre-med track as a lot of people Mm -hmm. do when they enter college. Um, I had no idea being a dietitian even existed at that point. I just thought, you know, PT, um, you know, OT maybe working mm-hmm. as an like athletic trainer, kind of those awesome routes, but didn't even know nutrition was out there as one of them. And then I kind of took a, a segue. I got involved with sustainability and food equity projects. And a few friends of mine and I started a food recovery network on our campus. And I just found such a passion for sustainability, reducing Mm -hmm. food waste, improving food equity in our local community. And that's when I really started to engage with food because before I had, you know, even similar to Heidi, I'd never really thought about (laughs) nutrition too much. So when I was younger as an athlete, I didn't do a crazy amount of cooking or didn't get super involved in the kitchen, you know, Um, although I wish I would have now Um, (laughs) that would have been (laughs) helpful when I was younger. Um, But the turning point for me really hit when I got involved with this organization called LSI. I was in Des Moines, Iowa at the time, and it was this opportunity to work alongside refugee families. And so, yeah, yeah, it was uh, cool cool stuff, heavy stuff, but cool stuff. 
Um, so they came from different countries and they were given a plot of land and then they were encouraged along with my support, other volunteers support to grow cultural foods mm -hmm. that were familiar to them, that made sense to them because they're coming to, I don't know how they ended up in the middle of the country in mm -hmm. Iowa, but in the U.S., which is so different, right? Yeah. From anything, you know, they've experienced before. And so for me, that was really the point where I got to see food from cultivation to consumption because we would cook with them and we would learn cultural recipes and, and foods for them. And that was really that aha moment of mm. nutrition is the coolest science. Yeah. <laughs> I think we can all agree. It's the coolest. Um, food can nourish, it can heal, mm -hmm. it can restore and optimize the body. Mm -hmm. And I just found that mind blowing and yeah. really powerful. And then of course, you know, pair that with being a competitive runner, did a lot of like team sports, always an outdoor adventurer. Yeah. <laughs> um, and sports nutrition just became the right fit. Yeah. So that's my journey and yeah, uh, there are different turns and paths, but it led to where I'm now and I'm grateful for it for sure. That's very cool. Yeah, that's so cool. Uh, Annie, what about you? Well, I uh, talk about it in the book a little bit, but in high school and, and really in grade school, I always wanted to be an oceanographer. I wanted to do marine sciences, um, vet work, stuff like that. Very cool. And having parents that were teachers and kind of like this, mm. um, I was kind of always told you should be a teacher. Mm. Uh, that's what they knew. Mm -hmm. And I'd even mentioned like, I'd like to be a therapist. I'd like to mm -hmm. do counseling. No, no, shouldn't do that either. <laughs> and I, so I was kind of, you know, a lost puppy and senior year, or junior year, you take that test that says like what you should be when you grow up. I did two of them. One said unknown and the other said farmer. <laughs> and I was like, I don't like either of those things. <laughs> What's, knowing my personality, I'm sure this is hysterical too, Nicole. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, decide, you know, I'm seeing someone at the time and my boyfriend was going to the, you know, ex school. And I was like, I guess I'll go there. <laughs> I was like, no direction because yeah. what I actually wanted to do was not nurtured. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I was too... I mean, back in the day, we didn't have the resources they do today to find colleges. Like we, you were on your own and there was, we didn't have really good counselors. Like it was just you yep. figuring it out. Yep. And uh, so I ended up, you know, at Marquette, which is great, started in education. And then at some point I actually, um, relationship goes astray. Everything just gets fucked up. And I was like, I don't want to be a teacher. I'm trying to control things. I started going down the eating disorder path. So I was like, how can I make my eating disorder stronger? I'll get a degree in dietetics. <laughs> that'll work. That'll, that'll do it. So I switched. I went to Mount Mary. Yeah. Started in dietetics and a big ball of anxiety, OCD, eating disorder, and depression all wrapped into one. Learning how to be learning about nutrition. So it's it's fueling it even more. And then, um, you know, you you start to realize, I think I need a therapy. <laughs> I think I need help. So you recruit people and eventually you get better. And then, you know, leads you down to this path of now obviously working with eating disorders and, and athletes and stuff like that. But it really was this turn. And I still don't feel completely um, supported, uh, you know, mm. by family, but I also don't feel like I'm doing my calling sometimes, mm. you know, mm -hmm. where it's like, I, I love what I do, but it, there's always a piece of me that's like, God, I wish I really would have stuck to my guns of doing the vet work or doing, you know, yeah. doing animal like care. the whales are calling. The whales, the yeah, whales the, are the dolphins are there. And I'm like, God <laughs> damn it. So it's, it's, I, again, I love science. You know, you guys talk about being bio majors or kind of like, what do you do with that? I, I have a bio degree. I was almost <laughs> chemistry. Like, I love the sciences. I love food chemistry. Food science was incredible. So I love nutrition and I really enjoy it. I just am to the point sometimes where it's like, man, I would rather do animal nutrition because they don't talk at you. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. they're not complaining about <laughs> what's your recommendation. Right. They don't want to go keto. <laughs> <laughs> talk about intuitive eaters. Like, yeah, yes. yeah no kidding, right? <laughs> like the epitome, right? So, 
that's where like I still feel like my journey is still developing and granted I don't care to go back to school but I I definitely again it was it kind of I had no idea what dietetics was in the early 2000s I don't think that I don't I didn't know anyone who was a dietitian Mm -hmm. so it was a really jaded path to get there but it it you know I'm glad I did it I feel like I've had a lot of good experiences but yeah that was really it was kind of a a yucky way to get there yes. it was very disordered <laughs> so yay that was my path what about you Nicole <laughs> um <clears throat> well I think I like most of you too are just like really active as a kid and um I've always been a dancer I remember when I first saw Mary Lou Retton it was like she was it for me like oh my gosh, like <laughs> it was the stick, you know, and it was the, you know, the the vaults and the bars. And it was like, oh, I just love it. And I remember like tumbling in my basement and things like this, but just anyway, how does, what does that have to do with nutrition? It doesn't really, but it's a matter of like at that young age, I was very connected to my body. And I think I was just, I intuitively ate um, mm-hmm. most of the time until of course my eating disorder kicked in too in um, high school just due to massive massive family craziness Mm -hmm. and um, I remember taking I didn't even I remember in when I was 12 I knew what I wanted to do but I didn't know what it was called and then when I um, was in high school um, in like my home ec classes you could like go and, and like earn scholarships and stuff like that. And mm-hmm. so like, I was like, sure, I, you know, I like field trips. I'll go and take quizzes in front of people and see if I win anything, you know? <laughs> well, I, I apparently like won a bunch of stuff in nutrition. I was like, oh, okay. I guess I know something about this, that I don't know. I know. And so my um, teachers at the time were like, Hey, have you thought about you know, um, getting a degree in, in dietetics. And I'm like, I don't know what that is, you know? So they had to explain it to me. And then I'm like, yeah, I guess that sounds about right. (laughs) I too ended up at Mount Mary then anyway. So yeah, so that's kind of what happened there. And then you have worked in all areas of dietetics right away and uh, then have been in private practice for ever, literally forever. Um, but yeah, I mean, dietitians weren't like, even to be a, a, a dietitian in private practice, I mean, you know, my, my career began in 1999, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, it's like, no one was, no one was, no one was barely in private practice, let alone when you thought about, I hated this too. Whenever it was like, oh, you're a dietitian. Oh, can you make me a meal plan? Yeah, right. Awesome. Uh, I mean, some <laughs> terrible details in between, but by all means, let's not go there. Um, right. <laughs> so I like we were talking about, I'm sorry. I have a question. Yeah. yeah. I t- hypothetically, all of you, but um, so both of you went to Mount Mary. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Both disorders. Like, I don't know. And What's wrong with Wisconsin? Yeah. <laughs> What's going on there? Like, I, cause like, so I had zero issues with like, food I think it was aware of like body stuff in high school but then I got to college mm. and started like struggling with it was the mm. first time I remember like being aware of food and like yeah. being of calories and things like yeah. that and ultimately ended up with like a very severe eating disorder and mm-hmm. went to treatment like yeah. in my 20s but mm-hmm. I I like Annie how you said you know you're like oh I'm gonna get a nutrition degree because this is gonna help <laughs> yeah food. Be teach me how to be sicker disorder. Yes. I'm gonna master it right. it was like, <laughs> I'm gonna pay a lot of money <laughs> like I I don't think I haven't been able to go back and remember me like okay I chose this degree because I wanted to have more like control around food mm. my degree 100% gave me an eating disorder or like taught me how to have one oh 100% 100% especially how they teach nutrition as and and I so I teach a 200 level class at Mount Mary um in in the fall every semester and full um, circle full (laughs) right thank goodness you have a good head on your shoulders now I mean I know it's true though because I had that too yeah I I got the previous teacher's materials and one of the Mm. things she would do was record your calories, record your weight, what's your BMI? And and I said, 
we're not doing any of that. We, right. No one is going to analyze anyone or yes. yourselves. Yes. Looks, yeah. appearance, into no, 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 no. We can learn the calculations and we can. Yes. So what I did is I, you know, printed obviously without names or anything, different cases from, mm -hmm. you know, from the hospital. Yeah. Here's the patient's weight. Here's the, let's evaluate this person and what are their, yeah. let's calculate their needs this way. Mm -hmm. We're not doing our own personal. So we can say you're overweight and you're like, uh -uh. Right. but there's a lot wrong with some of these nutrition books that are out there saying um, hands down. It, it's like, awful. Hands down. <laughs> I think it was it was so like dietitians were weight loss focused it was mm -hmm. low fat stuff it was you know 1200 calories stuff. yeah and like yeah. all the food tracking of your own diet and yes uh, see I'm like I'm, I'm a preceptor now for interns oh um, yeah yeah of course and I actually just did a panel and was like talking to talking about this of it's so interesting to like think about and I hear this story which is kind of why I was interested with you and like Sarah chime in mm -hmm. as well I don't know what your program was like but feeling like there's this common thread of like a lot of dietitians had there was their degree was like wrapped up in their, mm -hmm. eating, disorder. their eating disorder yeah and mm -hmm. one of the reasons why I like to precept now is because it's I want them to see the back side like the harmful side of that side of nutrition and there's another way to practice mm -hmm. um, but yeah I just like so Annie when you were kind of were bringing that yeah. up it was because it took me a really long time to figure out like why I developed an eating disorder and I was like very confused for a while yeah, about yeah. Mm -hmm. mine was very pointed to a poor like a relationship gone yeah. wrong yeah um and that you know like I know that exactly in that control piece but again the the weird shift to I need to be a master at this boy that's a scary thing yeah. And once yeah. you know that that's happening, I actually, I didn't start in clinical. I started in food service management, which I actually, I really liked. Um, it's fine. But I, I told myself you are not allowed to take a clinical job until you are, until you're, you know, not right. uh, to me, that's hypocritical, right? Like you can't go and tell people how to eat or what to eat and all of these things, because I've, I've seen a lot of dietitians or people who think they're, you know, a nutritionist or whatever, give recommendations, but based on their opinions, based on their own disordered eating. And it's like, you have to 100% yep. set aside all of your beliefs. Absolutely. And, and really when you're working with someone with CHF, blah, 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 you're yeah. working with someone with cancer, blah, 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 eating disorders, athletes. And so I really was like, you're not doing clinical until you 100%, you know, because I, I yeah. that's not right to do. Absolutely. And I hope that, you know, Nicole, you're a preceptor too. Mm -hmm. When you get these interns coming in and I get interns time and again here and you can, I remember having one when I was doing, um, I was a dietitian for a partial uh, eating disorder and I had an intern and she went and I was like, oh, we're going to, where we were going out to lunch to Culver's to do challenges and blah, blah, blah. And I said, hey, go, you know, go by the group. I'm just finishing up a note sort of thing. And she said she didn't know we were going to Culver's because she's an intern. The patients knew and the patients were like, oh, we're going to Culver's. And she's like, why are you going to Culver's? That's not a good place to eat. And I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Like, oh, no you just way. like killed it because she has a belief. And it's like. It's it's frustrating and not only because of eating, you know, you're working with people who are they're even more. um you know, sensitive to that sort of a thing and mm -hmm. doing exposure work. But like this idea that it's fast food, we can't eat that. It's like, right. guess like, what? Like, they have like, salads, they have mm -hmm. chicken, they've got mashed potato. Like, yeah, it's fine. Right. It's, it's food, fine. right? It's food. It's, it's fine. fine. Eating disorder. I tell, talk about this when I present and then I really like reinforce it with my eating disorder clients of, which was like, I think one of, the most helpful things when I was in eating disorder treatment and was like very much struggling with like a specific thing that we had to have for lunch. Mm -hmm. My dietitian was like, Heidi, it's just exchanges. Like this meal meets your exchange plan, just like Correct. quinoa yeah. and grilled chicken and broccoli would. It is literally the exact same number of exchanges. It just looks different. Mm -hmm. And like, it was such an aha moment for me. So I mm. use that my mm. athletes. I talk about it when I present and like, <laughs> our bodies don't see the packaging of like a Luna bar and a pop tart. Like no. our bodies don't see, you know, a Big Mac or a yeah. Quinoa bowl. Like our body knows 
carbs, proteins, fats, Correct. fatty acids, yep. acids, sugar. And so it's like, yep. mm-hmm. it's like how it, its presentation is totally societally, like societal judgments. Like, yes. ours, so yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, it's just like, it's it's frustrating yeah. it's infuriating especially once you're in recovery past recovery you know whatever and you start to work with people where they remind you of what you used to be and it's kind yes. of like ah, you just want us to be like no life is so much better yes but I, I can't tell you how much of a better therapeutic dietitian i am mm-hmm. you know to be able to talk and again i don't share my story with any clients or mm-hmm. patients or anything like that um, but it's helped to be able to know, like, I, you know, to understand like this challenge is going to be hard, mm-hmm. but again, it's that reinforcement that this meal is no different than the meal you're going to put together. But this meal now has all of the, like all of the pieces you need mm-hmm. to grow, to do what, you know, whatever it might, like you said, the, the Big yeah. Mac, like it's all the same. Your body mm-hmm. doesn't know the difference. So it's, I don't know. I think it makes us better at what we do. Um, oh, and yeah. I don't know if I'm just biased in that way. Um, I think it no, makes me a better athlete because y- you know how to fuel. When you're yeah. not disordered, mm-hmm. it's amazing athletically what you can do yeah. when you actually fuel appropriately. Right. Uh, hands down. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, hands down. I oftentimes do like share my, I'm like pretty forward and mm-hmm um transparent about like my eating disorder journey and like my experience like before and during like with my young athletes um obviously like there's like certain things that just don't need oh, yeah. it sure. but sure. like you said I think just having like been in that experience and then for me like being able to like empathize with them mm-hmm. and like share some mm-hmm. of like the visceral experiences they're having or the right. thoughts they're having and like walk them through the process mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that's like one of the things that for me has been like off the back end of my eating disorder has been really powerful of like Mm -hmm. being able to use that like really shitty experience that Mm -hmm. like ruined a lot of my life. Mm -hmm. Uh, But understand that like, because I went through this, because I had these experiences and it, it lasted such a long time and there were so many ins and outs, like I now, like, because of that, I can like provide better Care. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, I don't know how we got here. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, it, it is it, it is always so interesting. Um <clears throat> yeah. So an, another question that that we had for today too is uh w- when you maybe were in school or even like part of when you were working and in you know, because when we're working um, yeah. we're still learning, right? I mean, that's mm-hmm. the thing. Like I uh, tell my, my interns too, your school starts when you graduate. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. yes, <laughs> you, you, the textbook thing is like, it's, it's hardly even a foundation. It's like, it's literally just a reference, but like when reality comes in and you're dealing with people w- who have like all the things or none of the things or that thing and different physiology, you know, just different everything's it's like that's when you really go to school you know what I mean anyway well so yeah I mean outside of the basics of nutrition biochemistry organic biochemistry and micro are going to help you more (laughs) physiology anatomy you know what I mean if you understand those things but so that's another (laughs) yeah so I guess what I'm what I'm saying then too is is in your own practices that are again you know schooling was there a point in in time where you were like oh, I so get that now, or that is so much more clear to me, or um, you were fascinated by something that you learned that you didn't, you know, know was there. I mean, you kind of all, you guys already were sort of talking about like how much you dug food science and things like this. Um, But I was just kind of curious if there was like, only because of the fact that I'm thinking of like, you know, we go into our degrees having our own level of beliefs and probably mm-hmm. food rules or concepts or judgments, right? You know, and so it's like when you kind of went through everything, did did something make more sense to you or or it but we also kind of reiterated that nope, it actually enhanced an eating disorder. Yeah. <laughs> so, it actually helped me create more no food rules. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's well, really funny. Then if, if we don't answer that question, I guess, and feel free to do so if you wish to. But, you know, I think people often say to me, like, um, they kind of scoff, like, well, do you actually practice what you preach? And it's just like, yeah, yeah. I literally eat all mm-hmm. the food. I love mm-hmm. onion rings. In fact, my husband just turned me on to pickle fries. Oh, what? they're so good. Yeah. They're freaking okay. awesome. So um, yeah. You know, whatever. <laughs> I mean, yes, I do. Right. So, mm-hmm. you know, um, how, how which, you- which should is yeah. a testament to just how disordered societal eating yes. is because they really struggle to believe that someone who's telling them to eat, I don't know, pickle fries that that's totally off base yeah do you know what I mean like that that would be weird and that's what's so like yeah kind of eye-opening in a way where it's just like why is this why is this so crazy the thing is for me because I'm such a huge advocate of just balance it's just you know whatever and I I can't like to me I just think of like (laughs) it's so much easier to live balanced than it is to not like I don't know why why do we want to make it harder? Why do we want to think harder? Anyway, that's that's me. But what about you guys? Yeah, yeah, Sarah, go for it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I kind of was thinking about this when we were talking about our previous topic, but just how I've been in instances too where I like to I like to break the mold of those like societal norm norms um, that are put into place and. I've been in situations where I'm, you know, the only dietitian on staff at, you know, a sports medicine practice or X, Y, Z, and we go out to lunch and people are like, so what's the dietitian ordering? Yeah, yeah, yeah I hate order? that. What kind of salad are you going to so get? So aggravating. Yes. Yeah, no, it's so I don't yes. normally like this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. yes. Oh. Oh. And we've all heard it, right? We've all heard it exactly like Heidi said. Oh, I don't normally order this, or like, oh, today's like my day off, whatever that yeah. means. Oh, whatever that days, means. Wait, oh no, yeah. today's my just, cheat day. Mm-mm. Hey, cheat, cheat. Oh my gosh. Oh, I do not like the oh, cheat. Stop the it. Yeah. yeah, please let that go. Leave that at yeah. the door. Check mm-hmm. it. We don't. We don't need yeah. that. And also, we don't care. Like we don't uh-uh. care. We don't really care. don't care. I give zero yeah. shits about what other people are eating. Please stop oh, telling us about it. Yes. 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 Mm-hmm. I don't pay attention. No. Mm-hmm. Care no. less. Absolutely not. Yeah. And so I always like to to challenge that, right? Of like, like Annie, you were saying, like, well, let's go to Culver's. They're like, the, the dietitian wants to go to Culver's. What? Mm-hmm. Like, what is happening? Like, it's okay. Like you said, a uh, balance. Balance is just fine. It's such an easier place to be. It's such. Mm-hmm. It's a less, you know, maybe I had a coworker ask me this too, actually, of like, how do you make balance sound like sexy, right? Because he's like, people want the things that are on one extreme or the other. They like really gravitate towards those quick fixes or those things that are mm-hmm. going to have that like, you know, immediate result or seem really desirable right away. But um, what a better life it is to be when we're just in balance yeah. and in flow and just enjoying where we're at. So I very much like to challenge that wherever I've worked before of dietitians do not care. We're not, you know, here to manage mm-hmm. what you're eating. We're here to be a part of the group and enjoy. And we can go to Culver's too. We can and enjoy pickle fries. Just enjoy. <laughs> if they and if they do care, that should be a red flag. Absolutely. Yeah. You know what I mean? That should be a red flag. And to your point about balance and like, again, speaking from experience, like, and I try to explain this to people, like when you're in that wackadoodle headspace with nutrition, that's all you can think about. And oh, it gosh, is yeah. so relieving when you're not there. Mm-hmm. And, and if that's a matter of being five pounds heavier, choose the five pounds heavier because <laughs> your brain, it, there is relief going on, you know, like to not, to have that balance, mm-hmm. your brain and your mental state is just, is so much better. You know, and your and, relationships, and the people around you right? will thank you. And your relationships. Thank you for being five pounds heavier. We prefer right, this. Right. And it's really, <laughs> no, I just, you know, you know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. So Yeah, that's awesome. So I guess uh, just to kind of end on this note, um, do you guys have a client story that you really love, whether it is an example of something that happened super positive or whether it's an example of 
something that didn't go so well, you know, mostly because they decided not to, right? They decided to like manipulate something or they chose not to do something that you, and then what ended up happening. I mean, we can go both ways on that. Just kind of curious if you guys have somebody in in mind or a situation, sorry, no people, just situation that had occurred that you found really interesting or you were proud about. Yeah, I have one in mind for sure, just because it's more recent for me. Um, So I was working in the collegiate space, so kind of college uh, athlete, had just super tough semester. I mean, like just hit with like thing after thing after thing. Um, You know, they're coming off of like their, as we were all in their their COVID year, Mm -hmm. um, chronic stress fractures, came down Mm -hmm. with mono. Then they get hit with like hepatitis. Um, oh, jeez. Yeah. Man. Uh, low energy, you know, inability to train as desired, uh-huh. mental fatigue because they're biochem and trying to do all the things, mm-hmm. right? They're trying to you know, balance a lot. Um, and so just like just getting hit and knocked down over and over and over. Mm-hmm. Um, and so finally, you know, linked up with them because I was their sports dietitian. They had been kind of off training. So didn't have a chance to get to connect with them right away, which I would have loved, but that's okay. We finally connected. Um, and just found out that there was just a ton of gaps in knowledge, uh, a ton of just misinformation, just not sure where to go. Um, not sure really how to fuel just like basic things of how to, how to build a plate, um, for oneself, you know, how to, fuel and energize oneself. Um, why it's important. Like we talked about in last podcast of eating carbs <laughs> during, yeah. you know, during exercise, making space for hydration, um, why that's important. So it was really a space where we had to do a ton of education where we met weekly, to be honest, to just get this individual back on track. And we just worked from the most basic nutrition, you know, up to sport and why those two coexist and the importance of bringing that all together. Um, But in the tangible way that it would just really made sense and flowed with this individual's life. And it was about a whole semester worth of work. And then we hit winter break. And then I get this text from this individual and they're like, I feel good today. Like I have energy today. And my mentality is so much better than it was in the fall. Like I just, something feels like it's clicking. And that's, I think the, one of the best, most rewarding things as a practitioner is not just the physical piece, but the mental piece, right? Mm -hmm. Like, oh gosh, yeah. Like the wheels are turning again. They feel like the energy and their mood is where they need to be. They're feeling like themselves. They're feeling stronger. Um, that was really exciting to hear. That's the most important thing for me. But then, you know, the spring hit and that individual started being able to hit those same splits that they were hitting, you know, two years ago. And then they started being able to PR in their first race after two years of being rocked by injury and fatigue and all this Mm -hmm. illness. And I think that's just like, boom, that's the power of nutrition, right? Isn't like it? Yep. getting things back on track, realigning our life, finding balance. And that was a whole 180 that I was happy to be a part of. And mm-hmm. um, I still keep up with that athlete and nice. so well, it's so great. Oh, yeah. That's, so that's nice. really good. Thanks I for sharing, it. Sarah. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah. We love those. Mm-hmm. Uh, what about you, Heidi? Yeah, no, that, uh, you know, I think there's a few, like, I want to say like success stories. Sure. That- out in my mind um and like when posing the question you know I think about and it's one of the things okay like what makes what makes a success story and then like those struggles and it's mm-hmm. it's so hard so like the two that came to mind in terms of you know athletes that are doing really well both you know high school like female identifying athletes one was a climber one was a runner mm-hmm. um, both had come to me with some amenorrhea some weight loss and just like awareness of some things have changed in the way that I'm eating and my relationship with food that I don't like uh with the climber I think it was her mom who actually like recognized things and Mm. reached me um and then the other one was like the girl heard me talk um in Portland uh and like came home and told their parents like I want to work with this person um and like over the course of I think I worked with both of them for about a year um and 
you know, the same thing. And they were just both like very open um, Mm -hmm. and very like just as much as they didn't want to do some of the things that I was encouraging and like some of the challenge meals and things like that. They were also of this understanding of like, I trust you uh, and I will do like, I will do the hard work to get there. Yep. Love that. Mm -hmm. I think like one of my favorite texts to get, whether it's, you know, when we're still working together or afterwards is I got my period back. Oh yes. A lot of young athletes with amenorrhea and whether they get it back when they're working together or not, like the fact that they recognize the value in that they are, they loop me into that celebration and they're excited enough that they want to tell me about it. Um, Mm -hmm. So that still is like one of my highlights. And yeah, I mean, I actually, the climber, she's now in college and I get together, well, you know, their family will have me over for dinner. Oh, they're nice. Home, and she's in college at, at the University of Utah. And so when I go home to Salt Lake, we'll get together. Uh, and, you know, she, same thing, like in the climbing world, very much, you know, the idea of lighter is better. And she's just been like crushing, you know, yeah. competitions and is a stronger climber and is, is able to, I remember at the end of our time together, she's like, man, now I recognize what my teammates talk about in terms of feeling strong versus feeling light. Nice. Uh, and then, yeah, the runner just being like the mental freedom mm-hmm. that she experienced, like you were kind of talking about Sarah, like off the back end is so, it's so fun to witness. Yeah. And I think about the opposite of, you know, I've been working with an athlete for a while now, off and on for oh, like a year and a half ish, um, who's really been struggling and ultimately like we're, is going to go to a higher level of care. Um, and it's, I try and like figure out and also re- like reflect to her that it's, it's those two athletes were like ready to do the work they didn't want to do it but they also were willing to Mm -hmm. and it's like man what is it about like this other situation that is making recovery and in like an outpatient setting so much harder Mm -hmm. and beliefs so much the roots so much deeper yeah and i and it can make like athletes or people just like feel like a failure and so like And, you know, at this point, she's just so like, yeah, relationships and like mental anxiety and, you know, the exhaustion and preoccupation with food and her body is just unbelievable. So I was talking to her last night, we were to do challenge meals with my athletes and um, we were eating together and, you know, we've decided to go to higher level care. And so we were kind of talking about that. And I think I was also like with this question of, you know, athletes that have struggled versus athletes that have done well, I always like to reiterate to my athletes look like, I was a dietitian and I had to go to treatment like sure. I couldn't fix it like, yep. I knew all the things yep as much as I like knew I couldn't do it myself right. and so just because you can't do it yourself or you and I can't do it in the setting it doesn't mean that you're a failure that you're weak that you don't like it's just it is what it is and so it's like I don't know I, and I don't know where I'm going with this but it's like what yeah, I'm just sometimes when I kind of look at various scenarios, it's like, what are, because I don't think it has anything to do with like character or desire. Um, Mm -hmm. Because it is, it's like a, it's a mental disorder. Of course, of Um, course. And I think that like, like, yeah, but we, because it's still not recognized as like so much off, you know, as a mental health disorder is these people who are generally more like type way or type a achiever mentality uh, will get caught up in like, I am a a failure because I can't do this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Well, and I also think too, once you have that diagnosis, people, or you go to treatment, people just, it's that automatic like well you're fucked up forever then Mm -hmm. you know like there's always that that kind of stigma that comes with it like oh I've been to treat of of any sort of treatment even if it's three days that you're there like oh I'm you know everyone's gonna think I have a problem or I'm I'm not fixable or you know that that this is still with you or whatever and it doesn't have to you know it's 
And that's, I think the, with eating disorders in particular, it's still very focused on women Mm -hmm. in society and, and people who are too thin. So, Mm -hmm. you know, you work with people who are not too thin and they have full fledged eating disorder. Absolutely. And and they're orthostatic and they absolutely care. And yet the medical side is like, their weight's okay. What? It's all about their stupid weight. I know. Yeah. I, absolutely. Like, oh my God. No, like look at their number. Look at yeah. the labs. Look at, yeah, yeah fine. we'll just give them some potassium. I'm like, what? I know. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, it's so, hard. Many, so many of those like vitals, whether it like that are just brushed under the rug or again, like mm-hmm. normalized, like yeah. in the yeah. community of like, oh, a low resting heart rate is an athlete's heart rate or, uh, uh, right female athletes will lose their periods with, right. when it's it really hard. And like, I would like, that's, yeah, it just aggravated. Mm-hmm. Cause yeah. Like, oh, yeah. like yeah. All, I just, I would, I was like very typical eating mm-hmm. disorder, like mm-hmm. presentation runner way underweight and lost my period mm-hmm. or just all the things. Yeah. But because I wasn't an athlete, no doctor blinked an eye. Mm-hmm. They were just like, Oh, this is normal. And like that, yeah, that's fucked like, up, you know? And like that idea of, I mean, I guess kind of back to that question, like practice what you preach. Mm-hmm. Like, the assumption of like dietitians eat healthy, like fed my eating disorder. Cause I was like, oh, mm-hmm. I can't like pop tarts. People aren't going to trust me to like pop tarts. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What they expect a dietitian to eat. Or I need to look, you know, like they expect a dietitian to look. Um, so yeah, I think also just like the normalization of, or how common, just because something is common it doesn't mean it's like normal yes exactly right right Right. Right. because i think i think we i think we can honestly safely say that and i don't i think it's a very high percentage but most people have disordered eating Mm -hmm. whether you want to call it a diagnosed eating disorder or not i feel like that's probably Mm -hmm. in the camp of like 80 percent of our population maybe even more in our country in particular. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, So, yeah. And, and most of that is, it's going to be, it's going to completely be a mental, um, uh, you know, issue there. So. Mm -hmm. Rooted in fat phobia. Of course. Right. 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 What media tells you, you, you should look like. And Mm -hmm. um, again, just, I talk about that a lot. You know, we're just, it's just a complete disconnect to our whole internal self and our body in general. Mm -hmm. So um, I find too, that when people really choose to just surrender to the process and take the thinking out of it, they start to actually experience their body in a way they have never and realize that trust can actually be there. And that's Mm -hmm. where I find, um, you know, people really healing. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah, 100%. Awesome. Well, guys, uh, we got to wrap up. I know Annie and I didn't really share, but I feel like we share things. You know, we, know. we, should, we should do a podcast. We can do this. We share, can like, do this all again. these things. Yeah. We, 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 <laughs> we, don't, we don't. This is your time, you guys. Yeah. So, anyway, it was a pleasure once again, at least on my behalf. It was a pleasure yeah. to have you guys. <laughs> 100%. Whether you guys have second thoughts, I mean, I don't know, yeah. but I'm just saying, like, <laughs> we enjoyed it. We enjoyed it. That's so, so. For all of like my pent up dietitian. Oh, good. That's why we made the podcast. It's to vent. Got it. Well, it's important for people to hear. Like, yeah, yeah. we're normal too, and we get pretty mad. Mm-hmm. Podcast. I was like, oh my god, this is what I've been looking for. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> awesome. Yes. yes. Amazing. <laughs> so awesome. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks again, so guys. Much. So excited um, to put this one out too. I'm I'm looking forward to any feedback we receive and, and hopefully people choose to contact you too. You yeah. just to reach out and say, hey. So <laughs> thanks guys. All right. Take yeah, care. Absolutely. Take care all. See ya. Have questions you want to hear discussed on the show? Find us on Facebook or visit between two pastries.com and drop us a line. Want to support the show? Find us on Patreon for exclusive content. If you love the show, find us on iTunes or your favorite podcast platform. Hit the subscribe button and leave us a review.